So we have a very interesting new Iowa poll with very Bernie. He is holding steady. Buttigieg is on the rise, but Joe Biden has completely slipped. We so are we're back with Democratic strategist Joe McClain and Gabby Orr. She's a White House reporter for Politico. Sorry, so captured yeah, by those right. poll numbers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Joe, let me start with you again yeah. here. Uh, you know, with the New York Times, th there's a lot to get into. But let's just start with the top line, which is Biden in fourth place. Mm -hmm. In Iowa. It's Iowa. Iowa Democrats and caucus goers are a completely different breed of cat. Mm. And uh, it's, I have never personally done the caucuses in Iowa. Mm. I don't really like presidential campaigns personally. So I'm not a great person to talk about this, but I think it's not surprising. Given the profile of the activists who participate in Iowa, it's not at all surprising to me that they would go for a more, a bolder, uh, stance. They're more interested in changing America than they are in returning to the status quo before yeah. Trump. Although everybody agrees we should, you know, all the Democrats agree we should defeat Trump. Well, that's part of the interesting thing, Gabby, is actually within that poll, they said that it was 85 percent of voters under 30 said they want to see a fundamental change in the mm -hmm. system rather than a return to normalcy. 70 percent of people over 65 <laughs> said they want to see a return to normalcy rather than a fundamental change. I actually do. I want to I wonder how is the Trump campaign going to respond to this? Because you mm. cover them quite extensively, which is now they are kind of the establishment. So in that type of voting environment, how does that work for them? That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, it, they've been saying for quite some time now that they expect to run against Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. um, that's the candidate that they're looking at. That's the candidate that they most fear. Um, there are some who say that Joe Biden would still be the more competitive candidate. But I, I do think that the Trump campaign is somewhat struggling to learn some of the lessons that they could have drawn from 2016. I know he won, and they'll continue to yeah. say there aren't any lessons that need to be learned <laughs> um, because of that. But there are, and, and especially if he's up against a female candidate like Elizabeth Warren who is far more policy focused than, than Hillary Clinton was and is far more um, radical. And I don't say that yeah. in, a, in a pejorative way, but she is somebody who wants to essentially overturn the entire system the same way that Donald Trump said he wanted right. to do in 2016. So it does put them in sort of this odd position where he's running against a version of himself back in 2016 huh. as the establishment candidate. And I, to be honest, don't think that they have quite figured out yeah, how to run that campaign yet. I mean, I'll, again, on this generational piece, though, just to dig some more into these numbers, only 2% of voters under 45 say they're with Biden. Mm -hmm. 2%. I mean, this has got to be, look, I know old people vote more than young people and all that good stuff that the Biden campaign, that the Biden campaign is happy to tell you, which I think yeah. is sort of dismissive and patronizing young people personally. But in terms of energy, in terms of future of the party, 2% my brutal. 50, my 15-year-old daughter, Annie McClain, mm. says to us months ago, well, this election is about me and my generation and our future, so why would we support all these old guys? Yeah. Well, Bernie Sanders does but pretty Bernie's, well with us. Yeah, Elizabeth funny. Warren does pretty well with us. That is the well best, but not with my daughter. Yeah, <laughs> but, okay, right. but yeah, but, but I think that's exactly right. I think, yeah. you know, young people are really fed up with the fact the government just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And the 16 election was about that. It was about burn it down. Just throw it all out because the government doesn't work. And you know what? They got a point. The government doesn't work right now mm -hmm. very well. It hasn't worked really for a decade. And they got a point. So you have a group of folks who say that Donald Trump is the answer, burn it down, start over. Hasn't been very successful so far. And you got another group of people over here who say, let's try something radically different. And you've seen that in, in, in elections back and forth. We've had wave elections back and forth now since when? Uh, 92? Mm -hmm. You know, and so the American people are dissatisfied and they're looking for something. And this election is going to tell us what that is. Yeah, I, I do think it's also interesting, Gabby. I mean, looking in that only Biden has now fallen to fourth among second choice, right? Yeah. So it's Elizabeth Warren, it's Bernie Sanders, and now Pete Buttigieg actually in cap or eclipse him for second choice voters. That's a terrible place to be because it basically shows that, A, not only is he starting to fall, but even if other people were to fall relative to him, he is not going to gain. It's a, I mean, it's just you can't run a campaign 
predicated on I'm going to get third or fourth in New Iowa, third or fourth in New Hampshire, and just pray to God that South Carolina mm -hmm. happens to hold on. I don't right. Think I mean, he's essentially collapsed in yeah. in Iowa and New mm -hmm. Hampshire, and it's not it doesn't bode well for his campaign. And the argument, like you said, mm -hmm. oh, we can pick up South Carolina and we will blow things out of the water there. Um, that's not going to create enough momentum to carry him into Super Tuesday, especially if he's up against uh, Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders or Pete Buttigieg, who has finished first and second in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, I, I do think that the Biden campaign is in a really tough spot right now, and they realize that a lot of the Democratic voters who are supporting those other three top-tier candidates um, at the end of Iowa's caucuses, at the end of New Hampshire, are likely to just shift over to whoever finishes first or second in those. And right now, it doesn't look, look like that's going to yeah. be Biden. Well, and let's not forget, those three candidates that are ahead of him in Iowa have a lot more money in the bank than he <laughs> does, which matters, um, especially yeah. when you're running a conventional campaign like he is. He has less money right now than Kamala Harris does, and look what's happening to her campaign. That's yeah. pathetic. Um, so I did want to get your thoughts, Gabby, yeah. on Bernie's positioning. He had a very good poll in New Hampshire that had him first from CNN, University of New Hampshire, this week. Now, this poll has him in second behind Warren, but he has the most number of supporters who say they are 100 percent committed to him, which is, again, an important, that enthusiasm is an important thing in a caucus state where people actually have to show up and navigate this sort of complicated process. Right. And remind me, I might be off on this, but I believe New Hampshire is an open primary where yeah. independent yeah, yeah, yeah. Independent either way. Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing I will just say anecdotally from covering Donald Trump in 2016 is the number of independent voters who were between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump up in New Hampshire in yeah. particular. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that, you know, 75% of that sort of unique voting block is probably going to go support Bernie Sanders on primary day in New Hampshire um, because they've been so disappointed with what has happened under the Trump administration. Mm. And, and so I do think that that's something that's maybe not being picked up in polls right now or we're not paying close enough attention to, but the independents in New Hampshire are probably supportive of Bernie Sanders more than any other candidate. Well, and you don't have a real race on the right with Trump this time, so yeah. why vote? That's not exciting to vote there this right. time yeah. around either. Quickly, Joe, that's last thoughts. That's a good point. That's yeah. a really good point. Yeah. I, and I would be, I would be thinking beyond New Hampshire if I were the Biden campaign. I, I'm not really sure why they chose to play in Iowa because mm -hmm. he's not a good fit for the Iowa Democrats, particularly in the in the caucus system. So I would be I would be concerned about what happens next. You, you, you take a bath in Iowa, you get killed, you go to New Hampshire. Nobody really expects Biden to win in New Hampshire because you've got, you know, Elizabeth right. Warren and Bernie Sanders on either side of the state. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there you are. So what happens then? You know, how do you get to Super Tuesday where Biden probably does well? Yeah. How do you keep his campaign from collapsing when you come out of those two places? And I honestly don't quite know, but I know he's got a lot of really smart people working with him. The only the only real advantage Joe Biden has is everybody likes him. Yep, that's it. It's everybody name loves ID. Uncle Joe. Yeah. It's you know, a name ID Joe man. Yeah. You know, he's just such a, he's a good guy. People right. like him. That's I, a tough place to be, though. Go ahead. No, it it yeah. really cuts into his argument that he's the most electable yeah. candidate. Mm -hmm. If he cannot perform well in Iowa, exactly. a white state, mostly, um, a, a state with numbers of uh, union workers and middle class workers, right. the exact types of demographics that Joe Biden says he will capture in 2020 <laughs> right. over Donald Trump, if he can't finish third in Iowa, uh, it completely demolished. Well, and same deal with New Hampshire, which let's not forget, those are two swing states, you know, right. come November. Great to have you guys. Thank Interesting you guys. Stuff. Thanks both. Have a great weekend, everyone. Be sure to keep an eye on our YouTube channel this weekend for some great interviews we're going to post. We talked to the founding members of Matriarch. It's a PAC seeking to engage more working class progressive women in the political process. And we also talked to a professor who talks about how to rein in big tech. He's working on being a Bernie Sanders surrogate as well. It's an interesting one. Very interesting. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss tons of our interesting interviews, our week in review, and the rising cues that are coming up on Saturday and Sunday. We will see you guys on Monday. Have a great one, guys.